Thank you so much. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello. Hi there. Not, not the school teachers. He'd have to say good afternoon, Mr. Shuka. You probably couldn't spell it either. Um, I'm Gavin Shuka. I'm the Labour and Cooperative MP for the South. And actually, sadly, at this point, the only Labour and Cooperative MP in our region, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here and so heartened about the link and connection. The other reason, if I'm really honest, as to why I was so pleased to hear that today's event would be going on here is I actually know Cambridge. Um, I've lived in Luton pretty much all my life, uh, but I was really fortunate uh, when I left school to be able to apply for a bursary to come to Cambridge to study. And uh, it was actually in Cambridge that was the first time that I first came across uh, cooperatives in any forms. Um, actually, you'll be hearing from Debbie Bread later today. Uh, many of my friends were involved in working there and there was just something about a buzz and an energy about the cooperative movement perhaps for the first time uh, that I came across and second me a seed that was planted uh, that came to fruition much much later uh, when I stood in my home seat of Luton South as a Labour and Cooperative candidate becoming a Labour and Cooperative MP. Today I chair the Cooperative Party's parliamentary group uh, there are 38 Labour and Cooperative MPs in Westminster, the highest number ever. Even if you go back to 1945 and that landslide, you were talking about 27, I think, when they were first initially elected. And that alone tells its own story about the successes that we experienced during the last general election, even though we're not uh, in government, we hope to um, forge a powerful opposition uh, in the face of many things that are coming through which I think will likely concern most people in this room, uh, and certainly concern me. But Cambridge, of course, isn't just significant uh, for the fact that I went here, as much as I'd like it to be, uh, and lived here actually just up the road on the Arbour. Uh, it's significant as well because of its place in cooperative party history. I don't know how much of this came up this morning in the discussions uh, when Sally was talking or Pauline, but. Actually, there is a rich history. I believe it's next year, it's the 150th year of the Cambridge and District Co-op Society, I have to get the name right. Uh, that society, if you go back to the time when the Cooperative Party was forged, 100 years ago, had about 9,000 members right across the area of Cambridge. And if you think about the pre-welfare state Cambridge, or the pre-welfare state Britain, some parallels with where we are today actually, uh, a huge amount of poverty that needed to be relieved and released, not just through government intervention, as important as that was, and we learned that lesson under Atley, and I'll go and say a few words about that in a second, but actually through self-help, through fairness, through decent business practices, through knowing that you could go to a store and there wouldn't be someone putting their fingers on the scales, taking money out of the pockets of those people for whom fair business practices really, truly matter. In the field of housing, where actually one of the ways in which the housing crisis was met 150, 100 years ago, and actually still today if you look across the region, is through fair business practices, through workers' co-ops coming together, housing co-ops coming together, to make sure that there's a fair rent and a fair price, and that people aren't being exploited. You know, these ideas actually when you think about them, they are genuinely timeless. And yet I do believe there are ideas for our time today, which is why it's such an exciting time to be involved in this cooperative movement, alongside many of the young and exciting and dynamic co-ops that you heard about this morning from Sally, but also the existing ones that are putting in place a constant focus on fairness and equality. Uh, just tell you one other story which really struck me, and I've been reading um, a book recently by William Henry Brown, Corporation in the University Town, which actually talks about Cambridge, and I encourage you to look at it. Uh, but a name cropped up, uh, it was Emily Davis. Now, Emily Davis is probably much more significant to me than she is to you. The reason why I had the opportunity to come and study at this university, despite coming from a background where very few people would likely come and study here, I'm talking about the University of Cambridge, I know there's more than one here in, uh, in Cambridge, is she forged the college that I actually went on to go and study at. Emily Davis 
in the 1840s, moved a small college from Hitchin, which is close to where I live, uh, to Cambridge, the outskirts of, I like to point out. I used to cycle backwards and forwards to it, and I used to be a lot slimmer in those days as well, I have to be honest. Uh, it's just outside uh, the, the city limits in Girton. <coughs> Emily Davis was the founder of Girton. She also forged the Emily Davis Bursary, the scheme under which I got the opportunity to come and study and was able to afford university tuition in those days. Uh, and actually it was the first college that educated women. Uh, thankfully they changed their minds in the 1980s and allowed men to come along as well, otherwise uh, I would be here today. But her niece, Margaret Llewellyn, would become the General Secretary of the Women's Cooperative Guild for 30 years. So when you go back to the uh, forging of the co-op party, at that time she was a leading figure working to make things political and saying that there has to be not just an expression of good business practice, uh, workers' cooperatives and housing and banking and uh, credit unions and so on, but there needs to be a political focus to this work. Because if there's no one in Westminster advocating, uh, and in the town halls up and down this country, for cooperative solutions, you can't be surprised when they get held back against other forms uh, of practice. And that's at the heart of the cooperative part today. The reason why I tell you these stories is not just to draw the link between my story in Cambridge or Cambridge's story in the cooperative uh, system, but because I believe increasingly in politics and in life and history that lots of little stories going to make up big stories. And I just want to tell you three stories today to finish on. The first story is a story that starts in 1945. It has roots that go much deeper from it, but when we look at it, uh, we see a story about the way in which our country was shaped, the economy, uh, the social values, our values around the world. And it's the story of that first Atlee government that I referred to before. Now for me, Atlee is a political hero. You wouldn't be surprised to hear that. I'm a Labour and Cooperative MP. Uh, but what he set in train and what he released was after a period of long disruption, Second World War, but also probably years running up to it. It came and it was a powerful new idea, an economic model that drove incredible growth. When we um, were uh, coming out of the Second World War, we were indebted to the world. We had a debt to GDP of over 200%. And we invested in the economy. We took certain assets that were privately owned and we brought them back into public ownership or into public ownership for the first time. And what you see is a, a massive kind of reduction in inequality, housing stock being tackled, you know, all these amazing stories that we tell ourselves about that first story, and I don't want to undermine it at all. I also want to draw your attention to a period about 30 years on, though, where the thing that made it really powerful and made, really made it grow and develop and shape our Britain also becomes one of the things that starts to undermine that model towards the end. So you get to the 70s, you get a period of kind of rising inflation, you get a period of um, uh, stagnating uh, progress in Britain, uh, and you get a series of kind of um, major kind of movements, trade unions and so on. The government was directly involved in setting wages and prices, and there's a sense in which that model, as powerful as it was, as amazing as it was, and actually how that story is so important for us, uh, many of us that are Labour and Cooperative Party members, kind of is the thing that pushes it over the edge. I'll come back to it. The second story is a story that I feel much less of an affinity with. It's a story of what comes off the back of the 70s, a period of disruption and decline and change. And then you get the Thatcher government. It's parallel with the Reagan administration now in uh, the US as well. And what's the central idea there? Well, it's the idea that actually the way in which you can make the economy grow and get prosperity and so on, would be for government to get out of the way, the opposite of the Atlee government. When I walk into um, members' lobby in Parliament and I do the tour with people, I say, uh, you know, look, we've got four big figures, two by the chamber and two as you come in. Uh, you've got Lloyd George, who won the First World War, and Churchill, who won the Second World War, and Clement Atlee, who created the welfare state, and Margaret Thatcher, who dismantled it. Uh, I always make the point, you know, these are big, epochal kind of stories 
that can be summed up uh, in lots of kind of different ways. And the Thatcher thing was greed is good. Greed is good. We saw that, you know. We saw absolutely we became a richer nation. Inequality, by the way, went up by three times uh, during the 1980s and that period of time as well. And on the surface of it, you kind of look and you can see how much of a richer nation we are after that period. But the same thing goes on. So even when my party came to power in 1997, we didn't say we're going to sweep away the market and go back to that old system. We said we're going to keep the market. But what we're going to do is we're going to redistribute that wealth. We're going to put it back into tax credits and so on. You get to 2008, you have a global financial crisis, a massive period of disruption, one that we're living through right today. I tell you those two stories because I want to set up the third. What we tend to see is we see a period of major decline, change, disruption in our country, and then the establishing of a new political and economic model. We saw it in 1945 and what happened in the 70s, about 30 years. We saw it in the early 1980s and what happened towards the end of the 2010s, about 30 years. And my contention for anyone that's looking at politics and thinks it's completely standing on its head at the moment, can't understand what's going on, these upstart movements, these big shifts and changes, is that I think we've gone through that period. And the third story is a third story that we have to write together. We have to collectively decide what that looks like now. When it happens, it will be forged, actually, with things that mean that we get growth and change and a big renaissance in this country, and I'm hopeful about what that looks like. There are many signs to suggest that we shouldn't be, we should be on our guard. But my hope is that we can find that. And we do that probably with the knowledge that at the end of that process, the end of that cycle, there'll probably be some things we baked in at the start that undermine it. But that's our challenge, as people that are involved in social action, involved in politics, involved in running good business, with good outcomes, people that benefit and engage and try and work out and read the signs of the times that we live in today. And try and come up with responses that aren't just about cynicism or despair or wanting to walk away, but are answers to the times that we live in right now. Now I look at politics right now, if I'm really honest, and I can see a lot of echoes of those first two stories. I can see actually a group of people who say the way in which we solve this is we go back to where we were 60 or 70 years ago. We just repeat what we had before. Kind of missing the fact that actually many of those solutions don't work in the same way that would, they would have done before. The values are right, absolutely. But I don't think we can just take lessons from the past and apply them directly. I think we have to apply those lessons to the world as we find them. I see another group of people who want to radically drive us towards a free market economics without any kind of um, safeguards, without any kind of morals uh, in them, and say that's the way to do it. You know, walk away from your existing relationships. Go and forge relationships around the world with low tax, low regulation economies and so on. And I think the challenge for us as a cooperative movement, as we come into this second century as a party, is to actually learn some of the lessons of those first two stories that I told you about today. Because I told you they started in 1945, and I told you they started in 1979. But the reality is they didn't start then at all. Neoliberalism, there's a clue in the title. Many of those thinkers and those politicians, what they were doing was they were harking back to an earlier age of liberalism. They were looking and learning the lessons of what had happened a hundred years before. There was a whole world of history and drama and um, knowledge to kind of draw from. And when we look at our own story in my own party, that 1945 film actually was drawing from reports that were written during the war about the welfare state and the way to support people, but actually it was drawing on themes that go much further back. Right the way through to the levelers, right the way through uh, to the diggers, the, the people that were non-conformist in their approach, but believed in a more equal society and believed in societal change. And there were people to draw from, from Marx, uh, you know, after people say about um, the late party, it's got more to do with Methodism than Marx, and I, in my own experience that's, that's been true as well. But we also have a rich tradition to draw from in our movement. We do whether it's the Rochdale pioneers, whether it's the people who are right now forging ahead but drawing back on decent 
basic principles that people have the right to clean air, to clean water, to food that isn't contaminated, to good business practices, to driving out the loan sharks, from making sure that we have an economy that's productive, that doesn't just continually uh, go back to trying to put money where it can best be profitable for a small amount of people, but where it can be for a large amount of people. So I think my contention is, and you're going to hear a lot about this over this centennial year for the party, uh, I'm posting a, um, a, the reception about an um, a, a exhibition of 100 years of cooperative party history up in the People's Museum in Manchester, and that's in a couple of weekends' time, and I don't see many people who are around here up there. The Cooperative Party Conference in mid-October, where we're going to explore ideas to change Britain together. I think my contention is that just as you can write a story about the state and you can write a story about the market, those of us for the cooperative bent have always, have always kind of thought, if I'm really honest, that those stories, as important as they are and as much as they shape Britain, just misses something about the nuance of who we believe people to be as well. You know, when I go and cheer on Luton Town, my football team, I don't want the state to come in and nationalise it. And actually, I don't want it to be like the Premiership either. I don't want big money to dominate it. I don't want it to be about who can pay the most. And I don't want to put kind of a faceless person sitting in West, Westminster or Whitehall in charge of team selection on a Saturday morning. I want it to be a strong institution, something that we can have pride in, something that actually is owned by us and controlled by us democratically. I want something in which I can put my faith in, that actually reflects my faith in people as well. And I think it's those ideas, those ideals of opportunity, of self-help, of empowering communities, that have been at the core of everything we've done as a movement for a hundred years as the party, but much, much further back than that. So I think the challenge for us as cooperators, and the challenge that you're answering by being here today, is a really simple one. It's a challenge to write that story together, and my hope is that together we will. Thank you very much.